Hi, welcome back to another video for IB Environmental Systems and Societies. Today, we're gonna to cover topic 6.1, an introduction to the atmosphere. The first big idea about the atmosphere is that it is a dynamic and constantly changing system, and that that system is essential to life on Earth. The diagram you see on the screen is a nice systems diagram that shows all of the incoming solar radiation from our sun, and it also shows the outputs of energy from our planet via the atmosphere, right? You see in this, in this diagram, we have a bunch of transfers or movement of energy. We also have transformations of energy when, when incoming sunlight is absorbed by either clouds directly absorbed by the atmospheric gases or the surface of the planet itself. If you don't remember the stuff about systems and models, go back to topics 1.2 and 1.3 and review them. Right? I want to clarify something that is frequently confusing for students, and that is the difference between the greenhouse effect and global warming. The greenhouse effect is absolutely, absolutely essential for life on our planet. Without the greenhouse effect, there's no life on Earth. It's a cold, dead planet like we've seen in other star systems and in other places in our own solar system. The greenhouse effect is good. It makes it so that our planet is habitable. Climate change is human-induced positive feedback of the greenhouse effect so that the greenhouse effect begins to build upon itself and establish a new equilibrium of higher and higher temperatures in the atmosphere. The next big idea about the atmosphere is that the atmosphere is really responsible for the development of the terrestrial biomes that we see across the surface of our planet. In this diagram you see on the screen, you should recognize it from our experiences in topic 2.4. It's called a Whitaker biome diagram, and it shows how precipitation and temperature in the atmosphere are the predominant influences on the types of biomes we find here on Earth. Okay, the structure of the atmosphere. The diagram you see here shows the troposphere, tropopause, the stratosphere, stratopause, mesosphere, mesopause, and thermosphere. In all my years of teaching ESS, I've never seen detailed questions about the structure of the atmosphere unless they're accompanied with a diagram like this. The two parts of the atmosphere, the two layers of the atmosphere that you really need to concern yourself with are the troposphere, which is right here on the surface of the planet where we live, and the stratosphere, which is the next, the next layer up, because that is where the ozone layer is found. Those are the two layers you really need to concern yourself with. Right? We've said that the atmosphere is dynamic. That means it's constantly changing. And in this diagram or this graph, you can see that we have carbon dioxide, temperature, and sea levels mapped out and that they fluctuate over time. The year they fluctuated, we're showing how they've changed over the last 400,000 years. And you'll notice that changes in carbon dioxide seem to have a strong correlation with changes in both temperature and sea level. Temperature. Sea level involved in the hydrologic cycle influences the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. That's precipitation. This is how the atmosphere influences global climate and creates those terrestrial biomes. When I first put this slide together several years ago, CO2 levels in the atmosphere were about 385 parts per million. When I just looked the other day in September 2023, we were sitting at around 416 to 418 parts per million. So even in just a few short years, we are still adding more and more carbon dioxide to our atmosphere. In ESS, you don't generally need to memorize a lot of numbers, but these might be worth it. They're relatively simple. You should remember that about 78% of Earth's atmosphere is made up of nitrogen gas. That's N2, it's diatomic nitrogen. And that 21% is the diatomic oxygen gas that we rely on to breathe. The remaining 1% of 
of our atmosphere is made up of what we call trace gases. And in trace gases, you'll find water vapor, which is where the entire hydrological cycle runs through, as well as the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So those make up a tiny fraction of our atmosphere and yet have really massive impacts on life on the surface of the planet. What people do on Earth directly impacts the atmosphere that we live within. The single bis biggest example of that is probably our release of these very large storages of carbon through combustion into the atmosphere. So we're changing the concentration of carbon dioxide. If you remember, it's a tiny little fraction, 0.03% of the atmosphere. And here in these geological reservoirs where we have fossil fuels, we've got 300 million years of carbon that humanity has been releasing in just the past couple of hundred years. So the rate of that transfer of carbon from inside the planet into the atmosphere is radically changed in the last 200 years. Here you go again. The two layers of the atmosphere you need to familiarize yourself with the most are the troposphere and the stratosphere. The troposphere is where the vast majority of life processes on our planet happens. That's where our weather happens. That's where people live. That's where our industries are. That's where most of our transportation happens, right? The stratosphere is really significantly important because specifically of this ozone layer that protects us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. And we're gonna look at that ozone layer in more depth in just a little bit. Clouds are not just pretty things that people like to look at when they're daydreaming, right? They form in the troposphere and they play a really important role in regulating the temperature of our planet through a process called the albedo effect. Albedo is simply a measure of the reflectivity of a surface. Light colored surfaces, white surfaces like the shirt that I'm wearing, reflect a lot of light. Darker colors reflect very little light and instead they absorb it. And when darker surfaces absorb light energy, they warm up. And that plays an important role in the way that Earth's climate is regulated, which we'll explore when we've talked about positive feedback mechanisms, in particular around the melting of Arctic ice over the oceans. So high albedo, high reflectivity, low absorption of solar energy, that keeps things cool. Low albedo is low reflectivity, high absorption, and warms things up. So here you go, some data to show this. You can see the reflectivity of different surfaces. Dry snow, wet snow, bare ice, these are all relatively light colors. They reflect high percentages of light. When you get down here, and I'm sorry that this is kind of behind my picture here, you have darker surfaces such as exposed water. They absorb a lot more light and you see the reflectivity is significantly lower there. Right? The greenhouse effect, you should be able to outline how it works. Right? Incoming solar radiation, some of it passes through the atmosphere to reach the surface of the planet. What reaches the surface of the planet may either be reflected by the surface of the planet, that's the albedo effect we were just discussing, or it may be absorbed, right? And it may be absorbed by water over the oceans, which covers 70 something percent of our, the surface of the earth, or by the land. When the surface of the planet absorbs incoming solar radiation and the atoms and the molecules that make up the planet warm up, they begin to vibrate and they give off or they expel some of that stored energy. They expel it as infrared radiation. Some of that infrared radiation, which is long wavelength, it passes through the atmosphere and into outer space where it's lost to our planet. But some of it is trapped 
within the atmosphere. And in particular, it's trapped by carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane, which are three really important greenhouse gases to know about. So you may be asked to discuss the role of the albedo effect from clouds in regulating Earth's temperature. Right? So in this mechanism right here, right, you see the incoming solar radiation strikes the light colored snow and ice, and most of it is reflected. Right? So that keeps temperatures relatively cool. But as temperatures warm, right, as temperatures warm, more of this water absorbs light, warms up, and melts more of the ice, which exposes more of the water to absorb incoming solar radiation. Right? So there's a feedback mechanism involved in the albedo effect. This is of the surface. But if you look at the clouds here, this is a bit different. Right? Clouds also reflect sunlight. If you have a lot of clouds, you have quite a bit of albedo, a lot of sunlight is reflected. That tends to cool things off. With cooler temperatures, there's less evaporation. And with less evaporation, there's less water in the atmosphere to form clouds. So the number of clouds decreases, which means more sunlight strikes the surface of the planet, warming the planet, driving a greater amount of evaporation, which means more water in the atmosphere, which means more clouds. And more clouds reflects more sunlight, which cools the planet. So the clouds have this really important role as a negative feedback mechanism to help regulate over long periods of time the climate of our planet. Right? Outline the role of the greenhouse effect in regulating Earth's temperature. If there weren't an atmosphere on our planet, our planet would be much colder than it is today. And again, I'm gonna remind you, don't confuse the greenhouse effect with global warming or climate change. They are related, but distinctly different. Later on in topic six, we're going to learn about ozone depleting substances in the stratosphere. We're gonna learn about um, photochemical smog in urban areas. We're going to learn about acid deposition. And all of those are examples of non-point source pollution. And all of them involve pollutants that traverse political boundaries and may not affect people in the places where the pollutants are released into the environment. So we're going to loop back all the way back to topic 1.5, humans and pollution where we learned about different types of pollutants and established those three tiers of pollution management strategies. So if you see a question about pollution management strategies in relation to Earth's atmosphere, come back to these international mindedness ideas here, and that should help you formulate your responses. That's it for today's lesson. I hope you liked it. And if you did, consider liking the video if you want to find more resources about environmental systems and societies, you can visit my website. Or you can follow me on LinkedIn. You can follow me on all of these social media platforms here. Happy learning.